Hey, welcome to Plant Yourself. I'm your host, Howard Jacobson. Two quick announcements before we get to today's show. If you're interested in becoming a health coach, I'm offering another run due to popular demand for people who can't make 8 p.m. on Wednesday nights, Eastern Time. So we're doing another run of the program, which will meet the practicums will meet at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays, Eastern Time U.S., which means if you're in Europe or Africa, uh, that might be good for you. Also, if you're in the US and evenings aren't good and you have free time in the mornings, either 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific time or 10 to 1130 Eastern, then you can participate. If you want to find out more about becoming a wicked effective health coach, you can go to wellstartcoach.com. Second thing is, if you're not aware of it, Josh Lajani and I have a book that is free on Amazon Kindle. It's called Sick to Fit. And if you just go to Amazon and search for Sick to Fit, you'll be able to download it for free and read it on any Kindle enabled device, even a phone, smartphone, tablet, computer whatever. All right, let's get to today's episode. This is the Plant Yourself podcast. I'm Howard Jacobson of plantyourself.com. Well, start health and sick to fit. This podcast is part of my mission to help you live an active and action oriented life. So today's guest is Matt Buckner, and you may not have heard of him because he's not a famous doctor or researcher or book writer or comedian or actor. Matt is one of the quiet forces behind the Missing Chins Run Club. So Matt has had his own journey to health, starting off with needing a prescription filled the day before a business trip and realizing how dependent he was on these medications and where his life would be going if he continued on this path, kind of standing online at the drugstore with all the other people getting their meds filled and seeing his future out in front of him. And taking action and trying all sorts of stuff, not all of it right, most of it wrong, but being self-aware and pragmatic enough to make the adjustments where things weren't going the way he wanted. And until he discovered plants and running, plants and running the mantra of the Missing Chins Run Club. So Matt is now kind of the unofficial running coach. He has helped a lot of people with their form, with their training, and on the Missing Chins secret Facebook group, he's one of the people who gets the most questions and is really giving back to the community. He and fellow Chin Bob Page started and host The Grind, a Missing Chins podcast, which you can find by searching for The Grind Missing Chins anywhere you get your podcasts. I have put a link to their Facebook page in the show notes. So his contributions and his legacy extend far beyond the small secret group of chins that we're both members of. Throughout our conversation, Matt kept emphasizing what an ordinary person he is and kind of what he wanted people to take away from his journey and his story and his lessons and his advice is, if I can do it, so can you. And of course, that's more or less true of everyone, even the people that we put up on pedestals and idolize as, as people who have resources and skills and willpower and characteristics that we simply lack. Um, but I think in Matt's case, we can approach him without the baggage that comes from celebrity and notoriety and fame that often uh, pollutes our views of other ordinary people who just decided to take their lives back. So before we get to the conversation, a couple of quick things. First of all, this is the final week to get the early bird discount. If you want to join me and Josh in New Orleans, Louisiana, Matt talks about what it was like to meet Josh and to go running with him for the first time. And what a transformational moment that was for him on his journey. And we, I laughed because I had the exact same experience and so have so many other people. So if you would like to have one of those transformational experiences with Josh Lajani in his stomping grounds, his hometown of New Orleans, Louisiana, and me and a bunch of other people in a gorgeous uh, VRBO house in the Lower Garden District, Check out sicktofit.com slash NOLA. That's N-O-L-A for New Orleans, Louisiana. Second, I've got three slots open for laser coaching. If you're interested in that, plantyourself.com slash laser. All right, let's get to it. Without further ado, Matt Buckner, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. Yeah. So we wanted to. I wanted to talk with you about your evolution, your health evolution, your running evolution, and because you've you've transformed yourself considerably in, in not a 
long time. Um, and you're, you're not a doctor, you're not a professional athlete, you're not a trust fund baby, you're a regular human with a job and lots of other responsibilities. Um, tell us a little bit about like where you were before you started on this journey, kind of like a, a low point. Yeah, well, my low point was definitely I was sick. Uh, I was morbidly obese uh, and I was on five different prescription medications for everything ranging from high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Uh, I had uh, acid reflux. I had chronic back pain. Uh, uh, I had sleep apnea. Um, and all of those were weight-related things. And so my low point literally was at the time I was traveling internationally for work. And I remember being in a panic uh, because one of my scripts had run out. And there I was standing in line at the drugstore uh, waiting to get a prescription filled, about to board a plane, mm -hmm. uh, to go on an extended flight, and really kind of having a like an emotional break, like because because the uh, I was on tramadol for pain blocking, and so that was the prescription that it was a you know it was like a Friday. My doctor was out of the office that day. They couldn't refill the script without his authorization. My flight was leaving Saturday, and I found myself you know really just having a panic attack about it because I just didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, and, and even being online at the pharmacy was a pretty uh, emotional experience because, you know, I'm standing in line with sick people, elderly people. And here I am, you know, thinking I'm way too young to be mm -hmm. this in this bad a shape. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every visit to the doctor was just more bad news and me ne failing to negotiate out of the next step, you know, that if you if you can't lose weight, if you can't lower your cholesterol, if you can't uh, get your blood pressure under control, we're going to have to put you on medication. And so, you know, at the end of that line, I was basically uh, at that point, I got uh, prescribed antidepressants um, and I didn't find that uh, beneficial at all. <laughs> that made me worse. I think my anxiety level went up uh, and I I was just at a real low point and um, so that was I, yeah, I was at the bottom. So let's put some numbers to that. Like how much did you weigh? How old were you? Well, I stopped getting on a scale when it when it hit 285. Um, I did not stop gaining weight. I just stopped weighing myself. So I would say that I, you know, the number I always say uh, is 285, but I'm sure it went to 300 or got damn close to 300, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, this was, I was, let's see, I would have been 40, 41, 42 when, when this all started. Uh, when, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was that wall, that emo that, that big age, the big 4.0. And I was actually in what I considered at the time, fairly reasonable shape at 39 and going into 40 and then i think the wheels came started to come off at 41 and then you oh, know, really? by 42 yeah it was it was odd well it was it was one of those self-fulfilling prophecies too that i was paying i was very aware of uh 40 being imminent so i wanted to uh be in really good shape i remember spending a lot of time exercising and and uh you know watching what i ate when I was 39 and, and kind of in preparation for my 40th. And then after that, I think, you know, once I made it, I didn't really have a plan for going uh, forward after that. Uh, so, <laughs> so it was like on your roughly on your 40th birthday, you're like, OK, mission accomplished. I climbed the mountain. Right. And like, yeah. what did you start doing like to, to get you morbidly obese and on all those meds? I think while well, I was in a high stress job, I was, uh, sorry about my dog there. She's um, going to do that. <laughs> okay. um, I was in a I was in a high stress job. I was traveling extensively, and uh, you know, life on the road. Obviously, you know, you end up eating a lot of uh, fast food. You end up eating, you know, at uh, just the worst of everything, right? I mean, from hotel food to to grab and go stuff uh, to airport food, um, and like I said, the stress I. Turns out I'm a stress eater, 
You know, I, I admire people that when they get upset or stressed out that they're just, oh, I'm so upset I can't eat anything. It's like when I get upset, I want to eat. I want the comfort of food. Right. So uh, so that was it. I mean, and it was it was a gradual thing. You know, I think it was I and I think I gradually, you know, and that was it. Every doctor's visit was, you know. He would ask me, he's like, hey, I, if you could lose 20 pounds, I think on your next visit, you know, I could probably not put you on blood pressure medication. And so I'd be like, you got a deal. I'm going to go lose 20 pounds right now. I'll, I'll be right back. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then it would and then it would uh, inevitably I'd go back for my next checkup and it would be so you gained 20 pounds. Now you need to lose 40 pounds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and this what, is what sort of advice were you getting from your doctor about how to do it? Yeah, that was that was the really frustrating part was, uh, you know, don't just eat less or you know, cut your calories or use smaller portions. And, uh, you know, none of that was connecting with me. And and mm-hmm. I was doing everything, including starving myself, uh, you know, and going to the gym frequently. So I felt like I was eating a healthy diet and exercising properly. And yet continued to gain weight and continued Mm -hmm. to get negative results on my lipid panels. So Mm -hmm. it was, it was really frustrating to where I, you know, I felt like I was, it was a disconnect with my doctor that I'm like, I'm asking you what I need to do and, you know, eat less, exercise more. And I'm like, that's what I'm doing and it's not working. So Mm -hmm. it almost sounds like there was a connection between your, your self-fulfilling, you know, your 40, like, okay, 40 means going downhill. Like, was there was there some narrative like, well, I'm doing all the right things. So this is just my fate. This is just what my body does at 40. Actually, I was told that uh, by my doctor at the time that, you know, hey, this is what getting older looks like. You know, your your organs uh, aren't uh, don't work as efficiently. So your liver is not processing things the same way as it was. So your cholesterol is naturally going to go up and, you know, there's no problem we'll give you a prescription for that. You know, we, we have, we have medicine to fix that and here, Mm -hmm. take this statin and you'll be fine. And I was, I was like, I don't want to take any medication. And, you know, obviously the end result was acquiescing after trying in vain and ending up on four, four different prescription medications and just feeling, you know, at an all time low. And, and really that enabled me to go further off the rails because of course they did what they were prescribed to do. My blood work normalized once they got the dosage right, which enabled me to eat whatever I wanted then. It was kind of permission to go, well, you know, these these pills are going to keep me alive. So now a, now a bowl of ice cream or a bucket of chicken wings doesn't mean anything because mm. I've got a pill for that now. Uh-huh. So uh, online at the drugstore before that trip for the tramadol, you said? Yeah, yeah. Um, what, like, what happened? Did, did, did you start, did you question the narrative? Did you think, like, I've got to do something about this? Like, I could just imagine at that point, like, going into total collapse. Like, yeah, you know? I, wa- I was. I mean, it was definitely, uh, you know, I ended up, and, that you know, this was, and I had to, I was kind of having a, a little emotional break in the, in the drugstore, you know, and then managed to get myself, you know, leave empty handed with no prescription. Obviously they're not going to prescribe pain blocker without doctor's orders. And so, uh, you know, and I was already on the maximum dosage of that. It was about to get in to, uh, you know, opiates. And I was just definitely not interested in, in taking opiates for pain. And, uh, so, I, yeah, from that point on, I was I was looking desperately looking for uh, something that would I needed a big win, right? Mm-hmm. I, and uh, so, basically, I found that in in uh, doing a really calorie restrictive diet and and doing a ketosis diet too, uh, which which you know someone had given me some litmus strips so I could actually you know pee on the little stick and see if I was actually in ketosis or not. And I was really militant about it, restricting the calories and, and, you know, going precisely off the list. I was, I had a a kitchen scale that I was measuring portions with and, 
you know, trying to limit myself to 500 calories per day. Oof. And yeah, no, it was, well, and this was in my, you know, looking back now, it's clear it was self-loathing. Like I was punishing myself. I wanted to, mm. I wanted to inflict pain on myself. I, I was, I was disgusted with myself. I, I, and I was punishing myself. I wanted to, uh, and, and it was positively reinforced because the scale was rewarding my efforts. Right. So, I mean, mm. I lost a lot of weight really fast. It was a really, really unhealthy way to do it. Uh, but I lost mm. 50 pounds in a little over a month. Um, what? yeah, yeah, it was now I had, obviously I had a, a hundred pounds to lose. So, you know, but, uh, at that point though, once I got to the 50 pound mark, I started to get scared because I was developing some food phobias. Um, I didn't know what to eat. You know, I was, I, I was, you well, know, I, shouldn't, I was, shouldn't you just be eating like chicken breast? Like... Right, exactly. Well, that was it. I was eating like lunch meat and chicken breast and things uh -huh. like that. And like uh, were, carefully were... portioning out a cup of broccoli and, uh, you know, things were, like that. Were you like insanely hungry all the time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I remember uh, getting uh, sugar free, uh, like Powerade or something powder that I could mm. put in a bottle of water. So I was drinking, you know, a minimum of a gallon of water a day. I was always walking around with a giant bottle of water. And so when I would get insanely hungry, I would stick one of these, you know, sugar free packets of, of whatever sport drink mix it was. And that, you know, what it would have that effect on my stomach to where I would feel a little satiated for a moment and be able to mm. get through, um, till the next meal. But, uh, but yeah, and I, and you know, it was definitely, really negative, like going, going to the gym and getting lightheaded and, you know, staying on the, staying on the treadmill for an hour and, you know, getting on the scale and repeatedly things like that. Right. Now, did you have any sort of like support network or friends or family who were either guiding you in one direction or another, or like, I, I'm picturing you as sort of like this, this hungry lion. Like I wouldn't want to be right. locked in a cell with you. Like you sound horrible. It was, it was horrible. I was not a nice person to be around. Um, so no, I didn't, I, I mean, obviously I had, I had my wife, my family, um, but you know, and she was supportive, but I wanted it to be, again, I didn't want to bring anyone else into this. So literally I would remember cooking meals for her and my son and then eating my, you know, four ounces of chicken breast. And while they had a, sp a full spaghetti and meatball dinner in front of me, you know, mm. whatever. So, but that was, that was my rules, you know? And then I think uh, she obviously was like, look, we can eat what you eat or we can eat separately. And I know that sometimes I would just, you know, have to leave the table. It doesn't take long to eat, you know, four ounces of chicken anyway. So <laughs> <it would> be, <laughs> while, while they ate, I would go in the other room or go outside or go walk around the block, you know? Uh -huh. um, so, uh, but then that was when, you know, I got to the point where I realized that obviously this wasn't sustainable. It wasn't healthy. Um, and I, I, so I started looking for a sustainable way to, to mm -hmm. keep the weight off. I didn't want to. Uh oh, lost your audio. Yep. Now I'm in my back now. Yep. Okay. Sorry, my phone rang in on my Bluetooth. <laughs> oh, okay. thought maybe someone drove a, tr a truck by and it picked up your phone. <laughs> yeah. um, so how, um, how long ago was this when you decided keto was unsustainable, 500 calories a day was unsustainable, and you had to look for something better? This would have been six years ago. Six years, um, ago. Six years ago, November. Um, so, so, yeah, and that's when I found, you know, I found forks over knives. I found fat sick and nearly dead. Uh, and you know, for, I, I remember too, I remember a friend of mine, um, he was a personal trainer and, uh, I bumped into him and he was like, man, you're looking really good. Have you lost weight? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, man, you really, you know, I'm like, you look great though. Like you look really, really good, really lean, really fit. And he's like, yeah, man. And he's like, I've, I've watched this movie and it really changed everything for me. You got to check it out. And I'm like, what is it? And he's like, forks over knives, watch it. It's on Netflix. So i I remember watching that and going, hmm, hmm, okay. And then, 
you know, the suggestion at the bottom after watching Forks Over Knives was fat, sick, and nearly dead. And I saw that and went, Juice only diet? Now there's something I can get behind. <laughs> that's even that's even more self punishing than than exactly. four ounces of chicken. Exactly. I was like, I loved it. I ordered a juicer immediately, and and went to the store and bought metric tons of fresh fruits and vegetables <laughs> and went to work. And now, of course, you know that made me feel amazing. Um, you know, I was really loving how juicing was making me feel. I was still hungry all the time, but uh, I definitely felt better. I had a lot of energy. I was running. Uh, I was feeling really good. Um, and uh, so I, I thought I was, you know, this is something that's sustainable. And I remember it took, you know, it took four times the amount of effort because every your, your day had to be uh, structured <laughs> You had to have a juice close at hand, right? So right. Juice, to, juice is a lot yeah. harder to make than than to sear really? chicken in a pan. Right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Or or go buy a you know some lunch meat at the deli or something, right? So so it was extremely difficult, mm. but I you know committed to it and was always carrying around a, a cooler with loaded with juices in the so, in the car. Yeah. Did it after you started doing that? Did it feel the same kind of self punishment? As the keto? No. no, it definitely it it definitely felt better to me a lot and a lot more. It made more sense to me too. Like you know, when keto is saying you know have all the lunch, have all the lean meat you want, but strawberries are really bad for you. I'm like that's just not that's counterintuitive to me. You know mm. when it when a list of things that you couldn't eat was was four times as long as the things you could eat. I was like. You know, like I said, it was getting I needed a big win. It gave me a dramatic weight loss in a short amount of time. But I, you know, losing 50 pounds in rapid succession, having friends ask me if I was OK, if I was sick, uh, you know, because my color wasn't good. I looked a little gray, mm. you know, um, my you know, my face was sunken, you know, uh, so starting juicing, I think I, my skin started to look a lot better. Uh, my energy level went way up. And, uh, you know, other than being hungry all the time, I, I felt really, really good, a, a dramatic improvement right. over keto. So did your did your mood and sort of self-regard change at that point, too? Definitely did. It definitely did, where I started feeling better about myself. And I started to, uh, you know, instead of going to the gym for punishment, I was going to the gym to exercise and to and to feel good and to feel a lift. You know, I mean, before when I was overweight, I would go to the gym and have to come home and take a nap, you know? Uh -huh. So now I was, you know, I'm juicing. I feel really, really energetic. I'm, I'm running. I'm, you know, doing a, doing great workouts, feeling, sleeping really good. Everything was getting better. Um, I was reading, uh, part of what reinforced the Joe Cross method was I was reading Finding Ultra by Rich Roll too. And so uh -huh. his juice clients in there, I was like, aha, this is, I'm definitely doing the right thing. Right. So I can, um, and I, and so, and that was definitely, I, I dabbled in Rich Roll's book before, years before, but as a shortcut to some running tricks, I didn't look at it. I'm like, oh, this is, you know, that's nice, whole food, plant-based lifestyle. That's, that's nice for Rich, good for him. But hmm. let me see if I can carve out a couple of running tricks while I'm reading this, because he seems to be a really elite runner. So if I can, if I can get a couple of gadgets from out of this book. That's, that's kind of how I skimmed it the first time. Re literally, I was like, you know, completely bypassing all of the information going, yeah, but tell me about running. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> so when I'm rereading it while I'm juicing, I'm like, well, this, I seem to have missed this part before that he did a juice cleanse and then he switched to a whole food plant-based diet. And so I started going that route, obviously. And, and then, you know, the, uh, that was that was really about the time um, that uh, I'd heard. Obviously, I was an avid listener of the Rich Roll podcast. I'd, I'd heard Josh Lajani on there. I really that resonated with me. You know, I'm originally from Texas, just a Southern boy. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of my eating behaviors were the same as Josh. You know, it was that our our food was a birthright. You know, that we it was ingrained in our culture and and it was. Uh, less than if you, uh, 
you know, didn't, it's like, what do you mean you're not going to have barbecue? What do you mean you're not going to have steak? You know, mm-hmm. so it was all, it carried a negative yeah. stigma. So someone hearing someone like Josh resonated with me because he, he gave me permission to embrace that whole food plant-based lifestyle and still be a Southern boy. Yeah. So how did you transition from the juicing? Because I, you know, mm-hmm. I've, I've had Joe on the podcast and, you know, I know he, he admits very publicly that he struggled when he stopped doing the juicing. Yeah. Did, you know, for people, it can feel like, oh, my God, this is so great. But yep. it's like I'm coming to the end of you know, the, the road stops and there's a cliff. What do I right. do? I don't want to go back to the way I was, but I can't keep doing this. No, it was it was it was pretty terrifying, obviously, that uh, um, I I kind of transitioned to where, you know, I'd add in a meal along with the juice. So I kind of tried to wean myself off it, uh, you know, gradually. Um, And I remember seeing the scale go the wrong direction, too. And it terrified me. You know, I I definitely was more concerned with the number on the scale than I was with how I felt or what my health was. Um, And I'd, I'd really at this point, though, you know, through the weight loss, I've been able to get off the the uh, blood pressure meds, I was weaning myself off of the cholesterol meds, you know, the back pain was gone, because I'd lost so much weight that my back mm-hmm. didn't hurt anymore. You know, acid reflux disappeared, yeah. you know, months before. So how, how, how much of that got better on the keto and the caloric restriction? Not, uh, I'd say the it really, I wasn't feeling a lot better. I was but in terms of in terms I of getting off the meds. The, the blood pressure, the blood pressure came down. Um, mm-hmm. The cholesterol didn't change. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and I was getting lightheaded uh, from the blood pressure meds. Like I definitely, they were, my doctor was like, def- stop taking those immediately. And then mm-hmm. the next visit, it was like, okay, your blood pressure's, you know, it was slightly above 120 over 80, but compared to what it had been before, he was like, I'm fine leaving you off the meds. And it continued to improve. Um, the cholesterol wasn't moving. Um, and then, uh, and the back pain was getting better, presumably because I had lost 50 pounds and wasn't carrying around an extra 50 pounds all day. (laughs) Gotcha. So So when you, when you shifted from juicing, you said you started adding a meal, like, what did you know? What, you know, you'd mentioned earlier, like you didn't know what to eat. How did you, like, what did you start eating? How did you know? Where did you go to to, to figure out? I approached it from, I was looking at, uh, you know, all of the online recipes, forks over knives, obviously was a huge resource there. I remember, I, I think I'm recalling this correctly, that I was associating quinoa with it not being a carb. Uh, and so that I could incorporate quinoa. And, uh, so I did a lot of variations on those recipes. So you could have, you know, uh, uh, whatever, Mexican skillet or something, you know, quinoa, Mexican skillet. And I was doing things like that, which was great because it had beans and and tomatoes and all of the things I loved in it. And, and, uh, you know, and and at that time too, I was still eating dairy. So I would put some cheese on it, you know, (laughs) things like that. Uh, and, and was seeing, seeing positive results from that too. I was, but I was definitely afraid of carbs at that time. I, Mm -hmm. I remember definitely, uh, you know, I didn't want to eat any potatoes. I didn't want to have any starches. Uh, I wanted to, you know, and so I was, that's, that was definitely why, I, you know, people would be like, oh, try, try brown rice. And I'm like, mm, no rice. I'll, quinoa works. You know? uh-huh. So I was kind of using quinoa as the, as the no carb alternative to any, for anything in a recipe that had rice in it. So. Gotcha. And so what happened next? You mentioned that you heard Josh. Well, and that's, I, at that point, um, I am reading Finding Ultra, you know, properly and, and really getting the message uh, that I kept trying to go more and more whole food plant-based. And that happened, you know, uh, being a strict vegetarian first. But of course, that started with like meatless Mondays and then went to, you know, I found it really easy, like I think most people do. It's like, oh, I don't, I, I'm eating all of these dishes and now I'm removing the meat. And I enjoy it just as much with no meat and I'm, I'm still feel satisfied. I'm full. I feel good. I'm not hungry. So I, 
it was easy to eliminate meat. And I, you know, so I was vegetarian early on. And then, you know, obviously, uh, dairy was a harder transition, but, uh, you know, went to found some good substitutes. And, uh, uh, but after that, I, uh, I remember, uh, Rip Hesselston was, was just coming out with, uh, engine two, uh, the seven to rescue diet at that time as well. Um, so I was, I had bought that and that book really did speak to me at the time, as far as taking it to the next level. I think it probably was right place, right time. Um, I don't know if it would have resonated with me six months earlier. I probably would have gone, you know, this guy's coming on awfully strong, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and I remember Rip, uh, Rip was uh, at a local Whole Foods doing a book signing and I went and uh, heard him speak. And obviously those are real informal uh, little gatherings there. And so I had an opportunity to talk to him and uh, of course uh, dropped Lajani's name and had uh, had, had Rip was, uh, you know, oh yeah, that guy's great. You know, I've done this, you know, we've worked out together or whatever. And uh you know, then read that book, and that was just reinforcing everything that I would was already finding to be true. And uh, but really, I think that tied up a lot of a lot of things I had cobbled together from different places. Uh, it put it all in one source, and mm-hmm. really uh, about as plain a speak as you can get. Right? I mean, Rip loves to come at it from that macho, manly man, you know, meat is weak type position. So. Mm-hmm. And so, I and at the time it was just exactly what I wanted to hear. So so did did Rip help cure your carbophobia? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean that was and a, and a lot of that too, where having it all in one in one resource, having it in that concise little book, and the way he would break it down, where it's like, okay, I heard that, I knew that, but the way Rip just said it in the book made it really just it was all crystal clear. It it really mm-hmm. tied everything together for me. And uh, made me uh, double down on on all of that. Uh, so, do you remember your first high carb meal? Um, it definitely was potatoes. It was definitely <laughs> potatoes. Um, did it feel weird? Like you were like che- cheating was, on somebody? <laughs> yeah, it did. Especially too the as when I got you know really full from volume, you know, because obviously I. Carb counting meant restricting volume. So being able to eat a ton of volume and not have the calories present was a weird feeling, right? It made my, my stomach expanded, you mm-hmm. know, and it, it definitely felt like, oh, that's that doesn't feel good. You know, that makes me feel too full. I'm too, you know, I feel like my stomach's sticking out now. <laughs> but uh, that didn't last long, obviously. And I think a, a lot of it, too, I'd continued, you know, Every single thing I adjusted or or dialed in or or eliminated had a positive effect. You know, I knew I was on the right path. I knew that everything uh, I did, you know, it, it was being reinforced by my doctor visits as well. You know, my blood work continuously got better. At this point, I'm off all my medications. My doctor went from wanting to see me once a month to every six months to once a year to telling me not to come back anymore. You know, so it was it was phenomenal to have that positive reinforcement and to, and to have it be a sustainable thing. You know, I'd finally found the sustainability that I was, that I was searching for because uh, that was, and, and found it all to be true. Everything was, you know, validated. And the more I carried it forward, the, the more it worked, the more it continued to work. Mm. And what, what about sort of internal mental shifts so you mentioned you know your southern boy food is the birthright i don't know right. what 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 else that encompassed in terms of worldview right. but i'm curious as you made yeah. this transition how what, what else changed that might not have been so visible from the outside well i definitely you know was thinking about things differently uh i've heard a lot of people say this same shift where you know it's like hey i was quick to point out to anyone that asked me that you know, I became a vegan for health reasons, you know, and that I'm not an ethical vegan and that, you know, I was quick to point that out. I would like bring, you know, it's like, oh, so you're, you're vegan. And I'm like, well, I'm vegan for health reasons only, Mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then gradually that started to shift. And I, you know, voila, I became compassionate, you know, (laughs) and and I really started to, to think like, 
you know, I actually do care about the animals. I am compassionate. I am an ethical vegan, you know, whenever that occurred. And I, and that all that started to creep in. I think my, you know, I think so, because I know that I was vehemently against counseling my entire life, um, that I think I viewed it as weakness or unmasculine or, uh, and I, and, you know, if I'm honest, I was afraid, you know, it wasn't, I didn't want to find out what was wrong with me. If anything was wrong with me, I, I would rather not know. Same with going to the doctor. It's like, if you, if I don't go to the doctor, I'll never find out I have high cholesterol. If I, <laughs> so if I don't go to a counselor, I won't find out I have any issues. So, uh, but yeah, I think I became more receptive to it for that. And, and I was definitely more open, um, to trying new things. And, uh, you know, although I did kind of, you know, it started as relationship counseling. So obviously I definitely went in with the point of view that, okay, I'd like you to explain to my wife that I'm not as bad a person as she's making it out to be. <laughs> once you once you convince her that I'm not as bad as she says I am, we can move on. And then, of course, what ha ended up happening was me, you know, crumpled in a heap on the floor in the fetal position and are saying, I think we should see, see you individually for a number of appointments. And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, maybe we should. <laughs> yeah, and it was yeah always... I, rem I remember my own you know, cocky facade breaking in a yeah. very similar situation. Yep, it was. I mean, I definitely sat down with my arms crossed on the couch, like, okay, I'm going to tell you what's about to happen here. And then moments later, I'm literally just in a heap sobbing on the ground, you know, and, uh, and it, every subsequent visit after that was I would come in and I'm like, I don't even have anything to talk about. I'm in a great mood. Things are great. And then, you know, <laughs> an hour, a full hour later when I haven't stopped gushing and she's like, well, I'm going to have to stop you there. We're going to have to pick this up next week. And I'm like, what happened? Mm. You know, I was just, I was purging, offloading all of this trauma. Um, and it was really cathartic, but it, like I said, my point of view every time was, you know, I don't know what I'm going to talk to her about today. I don't have anything to say. I feel really good. And, and then I would sit down and she's like, hi, how are you? And I'd go, <laughs> vomit, whatever was on my, you know, repressed in my soul out for the next 45 minutes. And she'd be like, okay, <laughs> we'll pick this up next week. <laughs> Got it. So you, you mentioned. But then I started to, yeah, I started to really like it. Uh -huh. um, and she definitely was like, okay, I'm going to say that you're cured now. You don't have to come back here anymore. Because <laughs> I was, I really liked, you know, once, once I got over all of that initial purging, I was like, I can't wait to go back. Let's see what happens today. And she mm -hmm. was like, I'm, I think you're good now. I think we can, you know, we can stop making these weekly visits. You don't <laughs> call me, call me if something bad happens. You know? <laughs> I was like, what? I can't come back. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so I want to ask you about your running when you mentioned mm -hmm. it a couple of times earlier, but now I'm really curious about your running in terms of mental health. And yeah. and then, you know, I know you, you, you made a beautiful post, a secret missing chins post about yes. running and running with Josh. And so how did how did running play in to the the upward trajectory, the, both both on the physical level and on this you know inner mental, emotional, spiritual level? Right. Well, you know, I was and when I was in high school and middle school, I was in track and cross country. And uh, so running was something that I always enjoyed as a kid. And then, of course, you know, once once you're done with school and things, I guess you, you know, put down childish things. Right. So I was like I would run recreationally, you know, whenever probably whenever I thought I needed to lose five or ten pounds, I would take up running again and then stop. And then obviously at a certain point, you know, I just hadn't run for over 10 years and obviously my weight, you know, everything on me hurt, I would try to run. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, and I remember taking, you know, pain, painkillers before a run, I would, you know, pre dose so that I could get out there because my back would be killing me. My, my knees, every, every joint in my body was screaming at me. 
because uh, I was heavy. Um, so all of that obviously had, had gotten better. I was lighter. I was quicker. I was feeling stronger and stronger. Um, but definitely, I loved the uh, endorphin release. It it made me. I love getting up early in the morning and getting a run in. It set me up for the day. You know, I was I had that uh, endorphin hit first thing and and would would just be set up in a positive frame of mind, you know, huge, huge stress relief always. Um, you know, if I had a crappy day at work or something, I knew that I could go for a run and sort it all out. Uh, you know, anything that was bothering me, a run made it better every time. Um, coincidentally, I haven't been able to run in the last 30 days. I've, uh, had some PRP treatment done to, to hopefully cure my plantar fasciitis in my right foot. So, the doctors had me on a do not run, no impact protocol. So oh. I'm, I'm missing. I just had to go through the holiday season with no dopamine hits. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, with no running to to manage stress. So it's been uh, eye opening. I think you know, I a lot of that, uh, you know, was something that I was delaying, you know, where I'd kind of bargained with my doctor. I found a great sports medicine doctor who was confident that, that uh, platelet-rich plasma treatment would, would help my foot heal. Uh, but it came with a significant amount of downtime that, that you know, 30 to, to 45-day treatment window. So I'd kind of negotiated with him. Well, I've got some races I'm signed up for, and I travel a lot for business. And so... You know, we were looking towards the end of the year and he said, OK. And then when it came time, of course, it was supposed to happen at the beginning of December. And I was looking for any way I could to not have to go to that appointment mm -hmm. and not get the treatment done. And and thank God for my wife. Uh, you know, she was just like, no, we're doing this. We're doing this now. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, it was it's something it's obviously an experimental treatment. So insurance doesn't pay for it. So it was an out of pocket expense. So I was trying yeah. to justify it that. Oh, we can't afford it. Christmas is coming. Let's do this later. And she mm -hmm. was like, "No, you're doing it now. You're going yeah. to see him." And, yeah, and uh, so, how's it going? Is, is is it has it helped? Is the jury still out? It's no. It's going really well. I think you know he was careful to explain to me that it it only fixes what it's fixing, right? It's not going to cure. It's not a cure all. You know, it's like we're going to stick a needle in it at the injury site and 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 that's what's going to heal. And it's done exactly that. And, you know, the, and, but that is revealed that I've got, you know, all up and down the chain of my right side is, is locked up from the hips to the mm -hmm. thoracic to the hamstrings, obviously calves, you know, so, but I've been uh, getting, going to physical therapy twice a week and, and addressing all of those things and doing some functional strength at work and stretching and everything. So I am really hopeful. Um, my, my, Follow-up appointment is set for next Thursday, so and I'll find out if I'm clear to run yet or not. Um, but as far as the plantar fasciitis, I mean that that pain is gone, and uh, as I was confident it would be, um, I. But I had been dealing with that for over a year, so it was something that you know, I was, I think I was probably okay with you know going on with that for I was prepared to say hey if it's going to hurt forever it'll hurt forever yeah. you know it was easier to it was easier to put up with the pain than shut it down for 30 to 45 days you know right right so you you when did you join the missing chins uh it's been uh, that post was uh the 2 year mark 3 year mark i can't even remember now it was uh yeah uh -huh. 3 years ago uh -huh. 3 years ago uh last week i guess um so you said that was yeah i mean you, uh, sound, you sound like you know like you had all your ducks in a row at that point and but from the post it's like there was a there was a lot more ducks right to, to line up well that you know the missing chimps gave me the community aspect of it that had been lacking i was i was doing all of this alone and i felt very alone and very isolated you know i didn't have other than my wife and my son and my, and my daughter, I didn't have a support structure, uh, you know, that, and, you know, they were all very understanding and we implemented certain aspects of it within the household, but there was certain parts of it that my wife was like, okay, that's, you know, that's you, that's not me. You know, <laughs> like if you want to, if you want to eliminate 
you know, all oil from your diet, that's fine. But I'm not mm-hmm. going to do that. I'm not prepared to do that right now. You know, and and at that point, too, it wasn't uh, she obviously she didn't have any weight issues. She didn't have any health issues. And she's always been had that going for her, you know, so it wasn't even like I could point to her and go, you need to do this, too. <laughs> so so some of the more things that she considered a little more extreme uh was, you know, hey, that's, that's, you're going to have to do that all by yourself, which I was happy to do. But I was definitely at a point where uh, it felt it was feeling lonely, you mm-hmm. know, that I, I felt like I was living in a self made bubble, and that, uh, you know, uh, everything was, uh, I guess it was kind of getting tired of it, like everything was kind of a chore too. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, uh, and so I would allow things to creep in, you know, I would negotiate. It's like, well, I don't have to order all my sushi vegan. I could probably have a little uh-huh. fish. Fish isn't that bad for you, uh-huh. you know? And so it's, yeah, it's uh, like that, that slippery slope when you've, when you've right. run far away enough from the bad thing and you're like catching right. your breath and you're like, well, we can yep. walk a little bit now. That's it. I was, I was coasting. I was feeling pretty satisfied. That was, and that felt dangerous to me. You know, at that point, I think I was, I'd lost a total of 65 pounds at that point. And, uh, you know, people are high fiving you, man. You know, they love that Mm -hmm. that because you're, you're average, you know, I was at an, and, and I also remember people were starting to get, uh, give me cautionary tales, you know, it's like, well, don't take this too far now. You're good. You're good. Right. Uh You know, and I'm like, no, I think there's something else out there. You know, I'd like to be able to run a little faster. I'd like to be able to lose a little more weight you know, whatever. And, you know, I, I remember mentioning to my father-in-law that I, that I thought, I thought I had 200 pounds in sight. You know, I was, I think I was at 220 at that point, which would have been considered an ideal weight. Right. And, uh, how, and how tall are you? Six, two. Uh-huh. Okay. So 220 would have been at the, at the high end of the BMI. Right. So, uh, but I thought, you know, really I picked 220 as a goal weight because it was the only number I could remember associating where I was of a healthy shape and size. So I thought, okay, 220 is it. It seemed, it seemed realistic. It didn't seem too daunting. Um, when I got to 220, I was still like, well, there's this little flab around my middle here. I've got, you know, I've still got a little chin under here. Like I think there's more to go. And I just posed the number like, man, 200 would be nice. Like I haven't seen that since high school. That would be mm-hmm. great. Gotcha. And that's when people were like, okay, now you have an eating disorder. Now you're, you know, you've taken this too far, you know, have a piece of cake for God's sakes. You know, what's wrong with you? Live a little, you did, you did it already. Stop, you know? And I would, I'm like, no, I don't think I'm done. And that, and at that moment, you know, was when I met Josh and that was, you know, such an inspiring figure at that time. And on, you know, it just been on the cover of runner's world and, and, I'd been following him extensively and, you know, he's done the rich roll show two times at that point, I think, or maybe three. And, uh, you know, all of these things, I was just really connected with that. I was following on social media, seeing, so following his trajectory, seeing, Mm -hmm. you know, so you were, you were, well, you were like in new Orleans on business. Yeah. I was just there for a conference and, uh, and really just, just DM'd him for uh, like, Hey, any vegan, any plant-based restaurants you'd recommend. And he literally was like, I'm eating here tonight. Why don't you meet me and join me? And I was like, <laughs> <"Eek!"> <laughs> total, total fanboy moment. Uh, right. that, uh, I, I, you know, and I actually had the copy of runner's world with him on the cover in my briefcase. So I like grabbed that. I was going to make him autograph it because I'm about to meet the Josh Lajani. Right. And, uh, and yeah, I excitedly, went to dinner and uh there he was sitting in the restaurant and we you know it was it was like this larger than life moment that quickly became the most comfortable conversation i'd had like you and i are talking right now you know i mean we just talked for hours about everything and anything um and uh it was fantastic uh and but really at that point too i really felt like I was kind of calling myself out that I've gotten a little soft, uh-huh. um, you know, and especially watching him, um, you know, the meal we had in the restaurant we were in and, and uh, the options he was choosing. And I was like, man, I w- you know, if I was here by myself, 
I'd be getting the special tonight and, you know, with the, with whatever the cashew cream sauce on it and everything else. And, you know, he's, he's like modifying every dish and making sure that everything is, is perfect. And, and, uh, so I was, you know, watching that going, yeah, I need, I can tighten up a little bit. I can do more. Um, <laughs> right. and, and obviously on our run the next day, that, showed me I could do a whole lot more. <laughs> yeah, tell, tell that story, because I've you know i told the story about when I first ran with Josh, when yeah. he came up here to work on it. It was just like, yep, this is what happened to me, too. Uh, it was it it was a humbling experience, for sure. And I, I was already nervous. I mean, you know, I, I was following his Strava, so I knew the guy was legit fast. I knew that he was, you know, an ultra-distance runner and that I was not. But... Uh, you know, I also knew that he was in the middle of a, a 20 miler and he was going to pick me up halfway through. So I felt confident that, well, at least he'll be, you know, 10 miles in before, before he grabs me. And you were uh, going to run 10 with him? No, well, we were going to run an indeterminate amount okay. I, because I, I told him uh, that, you know, I'm like, I know I'm good for six. I don't know if I've got, you know, anything more than that. And so I think in his mind, he was thinking we'd see how much past six we could go, but not, uh, you know, he wasn't going to mm -hmm. do a, a six mile out and back or anything with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and obviously, you know, he's, he is the mayor of new Orleans when it comes to, uh, being able to give like a historic run tour of the city. And so it was really fascinating. Um, and we were talking the entire time as well. Um, but he was definitely waiting for me the whole time. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> he'd, kinda, he'd be running along, talking, and look back over his shoulder, and I'm ten feet behind him, struggling to catch up. So he'd slow down, jog in place for a little while, you know, kind of pulling me along, pulling me along, um, you know, or I'd be catching up to him at intersections, and you know, or praying for the light to turn red before we got to the corner. Uh, <laughs> I remember doing that quite a few times, like please please be red, please be red. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I remember trying to catch times. up with him and then like, he's standing there waiting for me and I'm like pissed at him. Like, how come he gets to rest? And I don't. Right. Right. I know it's not helping when you take off as soon as I catch up. To you. Can we stand here and talk for a minute? <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, yeah was, aside from, I mean, from that experience, like what, what, like, I, I've written, you know, in, in, in sick to fit and told the story many times, like those two runs that he did with me changed everything. Absolutely. And that did change everything for me. I, I was, I saw what, what the potential was. And I felt like I had, you know, a, now he was a real individual, you know, he was, he was as real as they came before, but he was, he was somebody I followed on social media. So now that, you know, he's standing right there in front of me and that I see how tall he is and how, uh, you know, running right beside him and see how effortless it is and that, you know, it validated anything. If there was any, if there was any doubt to that, you know, well, yeah, he posted up that run, but yeah, I don't know. What was that all downhill or something or, you know, and it's, then you realize it's like, okay, all of that is a hundred percent true and I've got a lot of work to do, but it was inspiring. It wasn't defeating. It was really inspiring because, you know, I had, I only lost, I hadn't even lost a hundred pounds at that point. I'd lost 65 pounds. He'd lost, all of me at that point, he lost, <laughs> he lost more than me in weight. So that, that made me feel like that I was really close, you know, that instead of having a long way to go, it felt like I was close that mm -hmm. I was just on. And I, and that's really all I needed too, was that added bit of inspiration. Um, and, and, you know, I, the, the biggest part of that though, was him saying, Hey, I've, I've started this little Facebook group me and a bunch of former fat guys, and I think you'd fit in, that was completely out of the blue. And when I, and that was what had me keep the motivation, or when the motivation would wane, mm -hmm. there was this group of guys that I was now accountable to. And, and that was massive for me. And that, and that has taken me from, from that point to three years now, you know, I, I lost 35 additional pounds from that point. Um, you know, I, I so you're, just, you're below, you're below 200. Yes. Yeah. So I was, I got my lowest was 185. So I got to that magic, uh, you know, hundred pound loss, uh, <laughs> point. I'm, I'm over that now. I haven't been running in the, and the holidays, et cetera. So, 
I need, I've, I can lose 10 pounds easily. I can't wait to start training again to, cause I know the 10 pounds will melt away immediately, mm-hmm. but I feel it, you know, when I, when I put the pants on, when I, when I put the belt on, um, so, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I'll definitely, that was the, the missing chance has been the, the difference, uh, for me, the sustainable difference for me. I mean that, and it's because it's a tribe, it's a community. It's a, it's a gang of guys that, uh, hold each other accountable in the, in the best possible way. Right. Right. And, and you're also, you've taken on the mantle, right? Like you, a lot of people are posting, like you're, you're coaching them in various ways and like, they're a little scared of you. Like you were scared of Josh. Like, <laughs> right. Well, and yeah, I don't know. I, you know, that's, that's still a little surreal to me that anyone asked me for advice on how to do anything, but I definitely, I. Uh, feel that the the need to pay it forward obviously that i i definitely want uh there was a lot of fumbling around in the dark that i did that i that i know we can all help each other shortcut all of those things and all those uncertainties and get the path clear you know that you know hey go ahead and skip skip watching you know joe cross fumble around drinking juice for a year and just go straight to the end point you know like you don't have to do all of that and uh so yeah, and that's and and obviously the the public facing page, uh, the missing chins, uh, public facing Facebook page where where uh, Bob Page and I have started a podcast, uh, sanctioned by Josh Lajani, um, you know. But that was that was that was an important part of it. Obviously, Josh uh, hates it would hate that I just said that. But without uh, his approval and authorization, we never would have we never would have done it. Um, but it was so that was uh, getting the OK, getting his blessing to do it was something that really propelled us forward. And and we just want to show that, you know, to be more inclusive um, and show that that community is out there. And that and because obviously a lot of people recognize who the missing chins are now. But then mm. you and so you see these little snippets, but you don't see a public facing place to see what what it is that that's all about so that's what that facebook page is and and subsequently the podcast and we're really excited i mean it's it's uh mm-hmm. picking up speed and uh yeah so tell know. people where they can go find us so that's uh it's the the podcast is called the grind and we literally have posted it uh everywhere on every platform that you can listen to a podcast on so it's on spotify it's on itunes it's it's on mm-hmm. all of them um, so if you're listening on Anchor to your podcast, that's where you want to listen to your podcast at. You can download it off Anchor. Um, so uh, and it's so obviously there's more than one grind podcast. So it, it would be the grind, a missing chins run club podcast. OK, so if you put in grind and missing chins, up comes our podcast. Right. And you, your second episode, I think you, you scored a real coup, right? You had a famous uh, comedian, Nikki Glazer. Yeah. Yeah. Nikki, you know. That's I owe that all to Bob Page. Um, he's he's a huge comedy fan and a huge fan of Nikki's. And he just you know I never would have done it. Uh, he just reached out uh, on her website and you know filled out the little email memo thing and requested a podcast. And she said yes, and I was floored. <laughs> isn't, really isn't, it ama- isn't it amazing like i i ask so many people to be in my podcast that feel like oh. you know like well this is a stretch and for most of them it is like they don't get back to me but occasionally someone does and i have to like lightning br- wilt that was like manna from heaven right like oh, oh yeah. my god fresh off of joe rogan and straight on to plant yourself that's I, amazing yeah i told him now that joe rogan um auditioned him he was <laughs> I, yeah, now he's ready he's, for plant yourself, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that was incredible. I mean, and you know, all of your guests are uh you get some really incredible guests on your podcast that that are like the who's who of the of the plant-based nutrition world too. It's it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Right, but I, you, but I also yeah. I also get hidden gems like like you that other people haven't heard of. So it's not just well, like another another you know copy of all the other plant based podcasts. And I appreciate that too. That uh, you know I'm and I'm honored to to be asked to be on too. I was kind of like, what are we going to talk about? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> and why are you asking me? But but I, I, you know 
well, many least... people immediately said, get your, get your mind right on that. Because, because yeah, if you, if I'm the guy that you look to that is, you know, he did it, I can do it. That's fantastic because you don't want it to be an impossibility where it's like, well, yeah, well, that's rich roll. I can't do that. You right. Know? Right. Right. <laughs> like, and of course, rich well, that's roll is... he's nobody. He can do it. I can do it. Right. Yeah. Well, we're all of us are in that chain, right? right? Rich roll was yeah. like, who am I? And Josh Lejean is like, who am I? And you're like, who am I? And, nope. and I'm glad yeah, you didn't, that... I'm glad you didn't end up, you know, bawling in fetal position at the end of this podcast. <laughs> No, I was, I was, I was worried. I figured you could bring that out of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work on video. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, uh, so what's up for you now? If you're healing from, from mm -hmm. the platelet treatment, do you have yeah. races? Are you, I mean, do you, do you yeah. like, um, do you, would you coach like outside of the chins, like, like semi pro, yeah. like what? No, uh, no, I keep my, I keep my coaching, uh, strictly amateur. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I had designs on, well, I have to be, I have to be realistic. You know, I have, I have a full-time job. I have a career outside of all of this, um, that I really enjoy in an industry that I love. Um, so, you know, while it would be great if someone said, Hey, presto, you can be a full-time health and wellness coach and, and match the salary of your current position. I'd do it in a heartbeat, but mm. let's be realistic. It's a little, it's a little more complicated than that. So again, you know, I, I, I do choose if you want to call them clients or athletes, I choose my athletes very carefully. Um, you know, so I, I pick, I always tell them that, you know, it's no surprise that you're, you're completely successful with me coaching you because you were going to do this without me. And I just <laughs> lack, I just attached myself to you so I could take full credit for it, you know, it's beautiful. because these guys are so driven. And so, and they just, they really just want, it's like, if you will, you know, they want it, they want that reassurance that am I doing this right? Or how would you do it? Or what did you do? So if I can, if I can give them that insight and that info, and a lot of them, I love the fact that they just want it. It's like, I send them their run program or their training program for the week. And they just execute it. No questions asked. It's like mm -hmm. anyone would be successful if everyone did that. If you execute flawlessly, you're going to get perfect results. Right. So, right, right. so that's who these guys are. They all do that. They, you know, and they, and they were going to do it anyway. They just were, they had some reservations about, I'm not, am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? You know? So, uh, so that's, I'm really happy with that. And the guys that I, that I can help, uh, in that way, um, as far as what's on the docket for 2020, getting my getting my injury healed up 100. percent I've got it's my I'll be 50 next month, and I'm looking at at my 50th trip around the sun as a as an opportunity to do some really crazy stupid things athletically. <laughs> so there's going to be another trip to Leadville this year. That's that's um, so, that's so funny because it's such a different approach to this decade than to 40. Absolutely. Well, and honestly, it's a different approach to my to the rest of my life, because it's not like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely picking up the pace. I don't intend to slow down. Um, and I'm, you know, I'll have a big 60th year, you know, crazy year plan too, because I know that I'll be still still doing the same thing and and still progressing athletically you know and not slowing down so uh so yeah I'm, you know we i wanted to go run the grand canyon again i want to go run leadville again um we're we're doing uh hopefully i might i will be clear to run the florida coast to coast relay um we did that last year uh and that was amazing fun. We're talking about putting together an, a six man ultra team. Well, we have put together a six man ultra team for this year, an all missing chins team. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, I've committed though that I am going to listen to my doctor. I'm totally bought in. I'm not going to cheat myself on the healing process. So, you know, if he says April is a little soon for you to be running across the state of Florida, then I'm going to listen to him as hard as that'll be to hear. But I'm hoping that next week I get some good news and he clears me or at least gives me the permission to do a little more uh, workout wise so I can get back on track to training. And then it's going to be a it's going to be a massive year if everything works out right. And, and if not, then I'll do it when I'm 51. <laughs>
You know, uh-huh. it's just, right. it's really getting, getting back to a hundred percent physically getting injury free. And then, and then it's Katie bar the door after that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, good luck with, uh, with, Thank with you. the healing. Uh, at some point Thank I'm going to, I'm going to join that relay. If Absolutely. You guys, if you guys yeah. allow me. I tried to get you on last year when people, you know, we always like to have those alternates and we had so many, you would express some interest earlier on. And then when it came up, came on and we had an opening, I was like, you were like, yeah, when is it? I'm like, it's in like two weeks. And you're like, I don't think I can make that work schedule wise. Yeah. Like, well, I offered, you know, it's yeah. there. So, but yeah, it's a great time. And I mean, you know, we know that it's, it's a big deal to make a trip and do a destination run. And especially, you know, that ended up being a 30 hour duration. So, you know, to, it's a big commitment, but man, it's a ton of fun. We had, we had such a good time and uh, just the, you know, the least of it was the running, obviously right. That right. just having that group of people together and, you know, sleep deprived and s- smelly and sweaty in the back of a van going down some dirt road in the middle of Florida. It was just the best th- time ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there's a, yeah, there's a special group of people who listen to that statement and understand it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Everyone else that thinks it's crazy. You're absolutely right. It's crazy. Okay. <laughs> Going to run a marathon at 13,000 feet is also crazy, but I happen to think it's a good kind of crazy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, that one I'm not sure I'll, I'll do again, but uh, Florida, I think, I think right. I'm up for. I keep, well, I keep, thankfully, I keep getting invited to pace for the 100 miler. And that's, I, I was really surprised that being a pacer is one of my favorite things to do hmm. because it's, it's, it's almost, and it's, it's so fulfilling, you know, it's that getting your runner, you know, through an event like that is so gratifying and fulfilling. So I've had the opportunity to do it the last two years, first with Jason Cohen, last year with Jim Gray. And it mm-hmm. sounds like this year again with Jason Cohen. So, um, wow. uh, and, you know, we see Goggins was out there last year. Um, so we saw him, uh, you know, uh, Gary Stotler is always there. He's done it the past three years in a row. So, you know, it's a who's who of missing chins mm-hmm. uh, out there on the side of that mountain. So, right. Well, I'll, I'll race you to get Goggins on, on one of our podcasts. We have requested it. Um, last year he said he was full. Um, and this year, uh, unfortunately, they said, tell us a little bit about the outreach of your podcast. And oh, we yeah. Like, I hate that question. Yeah. I'm like, hey, viewership <laughs> is uh, in the single digits, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you, show me your downloads. Let's see some metrics. I'm like, eh, did I say Josh Lajani? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you'll, I'm surprised he hasn't already been on your show, though. You've asked, right? Actually, I haven't. I, have not re- I have not reached out to him yet. We emailed him and he emailed back. Uh-huh. So, well, his his representative emailed back. So, I would think you're a shoe in way before mm-hmm. way before mm-hmm. our little fledgling podcast. But either way, I'll I'll accept that. We'll race to get Goggins. All right, we're, good. We're on it. We're <laughs> on. It. I'll I'll have to. We'll have to even it up. I'll send you the con- his contact details so that you can you All can right. be on a level a level field. You're a fair competitor. <laughs> All right, Matt. I want to thank you so much for for you. your for your openness, for your willingness to do this, and for for all the energy you bring to the to the inner workings of the chins. There's a thank you know, it's an emotional place. People are hearing the truth. A lot of them unvarnished for the first time, and and you're you're a big part of the positivity and and moving things forward. So I want to. As are you, and I. I... I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank you for all of the help that you lend and all the support you give within that group. And that, you know, again, it's one thing for me to say it, but I think you definitely lend a ton of credibility on the professional side of things when it's like, hey, you know, he agrees. He said the same thing. <laughs> well, that's you know? good to hear because I, I feel like I'm always compensating for not having been 200 pounds overweight. <laughs> no, I don't think I think that's a, a great place to be, too. And I think, you know, but, Dr. Mondo and I had that same conversation where his assumption of me was that that I was just some health and wellness coach that had never been overweight a day in my life. So I had to kind of frame myself in that from then on because 
I realized that I was turning people off with my approach because I was approaching them as a fat person. Mm -hmm. But right. visibly, I don't look like I've ever been fat before. So they were like, hey, man, you calm down. Yeah, you don't, don't understand you don't, me. Yeah, you don't know what it's like. And so I'd like have to walk around with a with a hundred pound overweight picture of myself on my phone to go, this is the guy that's talking to you right now. You know, <laughs> it's like, this is fat Matt. He's going to, he's got some things to say to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, when you, when you, when you quit your day job and become a coach, I think we have your URL. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Maybe I'll go ahead and grab it now. So it's yeah. not gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, th thanks so much. And yeah, thank you. I look forward to to running with you somewhere somehow soon. Yes, very soon. All right. Take care. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Bye now. All right. I hope you enjoyed and got a lot out of that conversation with the wonderful, the humble, the accessible Matt Buckner. If you want to check out the links, and there's a lot of links for this week's show, there's links to some of the races we talked about to the people who've inspired him, to their films, and to the Missing Chins podcast and Lifestyle Club. You can get all that at plantyourself.com slash 361. If you want to support the mission of this show so many ways, easiest, cheapest, fastest, is to just give us some stars on Apple Podcasts and review wherever you get your podcasts is fine. That helps people find us. Second thing, share this episode, let people know about it. And third, if you have the resources, join us in a more significant way by becoming a patron, a supporter of this podcast. This podcast is free for everyone and supported by those with the means to do so. And if you want to help out even a dollar a month, that makes a big deal. It increases my visibility in Patreon, and it also lets me know that there's a community out there that stands with me um, and wants this message to get out into the world. And it also just practically means that I get to spend more time on it and less time hustling for other stuff. If you want to help out, just go to patreon.com and search for Plant Yourself or go to plantyourself.com and look for the Patreon button in the right sidebar. All right. What else we got in garden news? Well, the, the one thing is there's some some greens coming in. There's some really hardy kale and like three bok choy, not bok choys, uh, like Napa cabbages that we've been cooking up into um, Asian soups. But aside from that, not much going on in the garden. In running news, I had two good weeks. I had um, two half marathons, not races, just just trail runs. But yesterday morning, Monday, I got up for my 730 uh, workout, bent down to tie my shoe and completely wrenched my back. So I'm, I'm canted here. I'm about 45 degrees, not exactly the picture of vibrant motion and health that you would you would hope your health based podcast host is displaying. Hopefully this will last no more than a few days and I'll be back on both feet instead of leaning on one and resting my arms on the on the desk to keep from falling over. Got some great podcast conversations coming up, some of them already in the bank, one with Justin Luria, who talks about spirituality in a way that I find extremely helpful and freeing. There's a lot of spirituality out there that under the guise of talking about manifesting actually blames the victim. And another whole branch of spirituality is really focused on betterment, personal gain rather than a deeper, more kind, compassionate connection to the universe. And Justin breaks that stuff down for us really beautifully. Also, last week, I had an amazing conversation with one of the great unsung heroes of the environmental movement, Carolyn Raffensperger, who is based, if you've ever heard of the precautionary principle, that's her baby. This idea that the benefit of the doubt should go to humans and the environment and animals and nature rather than profit seeking corporations. That's coming up soon. I also have a conversation that I'm going to record hopefully this Thursday with the one and only Dr. Michael Greger, whose new book, How Not to Diet, is blowing me away. It is um, one of the best written science books I've ever seen, and I heartily recommend that you read it and that you tune in when we release that podcast episode. All right, let's close it out with some gratitudes. So thanks to Will Ridenour for allowing me to use Sabali Don, the Dance of Peace is the theme music for this show. 
Check out willridenour.com for more of his beautiful Cora music. And of course, thanks to all of you Plant Yourself podcast patrons. Kim Harrison, Lynn McClellan, Anthony Disson, Brittany Porter, Dominic Mauro, Barbara Whitney, Tammy Black, Amy Good, Amanda Hatherley, Mary Jane Wheeler, Ellen Kennelly, Melissa Cobb, Rachel Burns, Christine Nielsen, Tina Sharp, Tina Ahern, Jen Fulganowski, David Bizek, The Mysterious, Michelle X, Elizabeth Feldman, Victoria Dolomanova, Leia Stoller, Alan Christensen, Colleen Peck, Michelle Andrew, Josina Julian, Roland Sudonik, Sarah Durkis, Ronis Turkis, Kelly Cameron, Wayne Pedersen, Leanne Peterson, Janet Selby, Claire Adams, Sam Franz, Jacob Nebetta, Muda, Sarah David, Donna Hubert, Cyber, Dorian Visa, Video, and Carol Argentati. Ruthanne Funderburg, Misha Rosen, Michael Warbeck, the Equally Mysterious, Tracy Z, Alicia Lemons, Rebecca Hughes, Val Lindman, Rise of Cinnamon, Nick Nick Harper, Stephanie Holmes, Martha Bergner, Nicole Ramsey, Susan Amon, Molly Levine, The Inscrutable, Harry R., Susan Laverty, The Panda, Vegan, Craig Kovic, Adam Sharp, Karen Burry, Heather Morgan, Ashley Corcoran, Kelly Machia, Deanne Norton, Bonnie Lynch, Plant Happy Organ, Sabina Kersels, Nigel Davies, Marion Blum, Teresa Copel, Show Rootless, Julian Watkins, Brito Connell, Brian Sheridan, Shannon Hirschman, Kate Rosalind, Diot, Julie Langholm, Hedda Gardy, Zutus, and Wakani Hainline, Aaron Greer, Alicia Davis, Aviva L, Heather O'Connor, Carolyn Jensen. Sherry Orlikoski of Plant Powered for Health, Karen Smith, Scott Marani, Karen Joe Kreb, Tritani Lewis, Kirby Burton, Teresa Carell, Kevin McCauley, Lilith Rothschild, Kelly Baker, Miracle, and Jesse, Cheryl Dwyer, Jenny Hazleton, Valerie Peltier, P.W. Evans, Colleen Harrison, Justine Diva, Jester Summermeyer, Dennis Bird, Darby Kelly, Lori Fanny, Linnea Lundquist, Valerie Hummel, Deb Casilla, Emily Iaconelli, Levy Wallach, Rosalind McAtee, Dan McCordy, Stephen Leenan, Patty DiMarchino, Mike and Donna Cartz, Deanne Bishop, Bill Briel, Quinter Schmidt, Marjorie Lewis, Colleen Moulton, Trisha Adams, Ian Kramer. Nancy Sheldon, Lindsay Bayshore, Gunmarie Hagen, Tracy Gullish, Laura Heaton, Meg for Mama Says, Met Rochelle McKennedy, Joan Borstein, Diana Goldman, Stacey Stokes, Ben Savage, Michael Kay, Holly Butler, David Hughes, Connie Rogers, Claire England, Sally Robertson, Parham Ganchi, Amy, Amy Daly, Brian Tourville, Mark Jeffrey Johnson, and Josie Dempsey for your generous support of the podcast. That's it for this week. As always, be well, my friends. So if you appreciate the Plant Yourself podcast and would like to help support the mission of the show, there's a few easy ways to do it. One is to just go to wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review. Let other people know about it. Give us some stars. Give us some love. And that really helps us be found by more people. Something else, of course, you can do is let someone know about this podcast, someone uh, who you think would benefit. Send them maybe a couple of episodes that you think would uh, pique their interest or just uh, ask them to subscribe in general. And third, you can join arms and become a patron, a financial supporter of this show. You may have noticed that there's no advertising in the show and it's free for everyone and it's supported, paid for by those who can afford it. So if you would like to make a one time contribution or an ongoing monthly pledge, you can do so at plantyourself.com slash gift. All right. Time for thanks. Thanks to Will Ridenauer for allowing me to use his beautiful song, Sabali Don, The Dance of Peace. You can find more of Will's music at his website, willridenauer.com. And of course, thanks to all of you Plant Yourself podcast patrons. Kim Harrison, Lynn McClellan, Anthony Disson, Brittany Porter, Dominic Mauro, Barbara Whitney, Tammy Black, Amy Good, Amanda Hatherley, Mary Jean Wheeler, Ellen Kennelly, Melissa Cobb, Rachel Barnes, Christine Nielsen, Tina Sharp, Tina Ahern, Jen Filkonofsky, David Bizek, The Mysterious, Michelle X, Elspeth Feldman, Leah Stoller, Alan Christensen, Colleen Peck, Michelle Andrews, Josina, Sarah Durkis, Rhymes with Circus, Kelly Cameron, Wayne Pedersen, Janet Selby, Kara Adams, Tom Franzek, Jeanette Benham, Gil Lacerte, David Donahue, Blair Cyber, Toronto Viso, Gio and Carol Argentati, Jody Friesner, with Ann Funderburg, Misha Rosen, Michael Warbeck. The equally mysterious Tracy Z, Aviva Lael, Alicia Lemus, Rebecca Hughes, Val Lenneman, Rhymes with Cinnamon, Nick Harper, and Martha Bergner, Susan Amon, Molly Levine, the inscrutable Harry R., Susan Laverty, the Panda, Vegan, Craig Kovic, Adam Scharf, Karen Burry, Heather Morgan, Kelly Machia, Deanne Norton, Bonnie Lynch, Plant Happy Oregon, Sabina Kurtzels, Nigel Davies, Marion Blum, Teresa Copel, Julian Watkins, Breed O'Connell, Shannon, Hirsch, Shannon Hirschman, Linda Ayat, Colm Hedegaard, Isa Tuzawa, Connie Hainline, Aaron Greer, Alicia Davis. Heather O'Connor, Carolyn Jensen, Sherry Olikoski of Plant Powered for Health, Karen Smith, Scott Marani, Karen and Joe Krep, Tritanya Lewis, Kirby Burton, Teresa Carell, Kevin McCauley, Elizabeth Rothschild, Ann Jesse, Cheryl Dwyer, Jenny Hazelton, Valerie Peltier, Peter W. Evans, Colleen Harrison, Justine Divid, Joshua Summermeyer, Dennis Bird, Darmy Kelly, Laurie Fanny, Linnea Lundquist, Valerie Hummel, Emily Iaconelli, Levy Wallach, Rosamund McAtee, Dan McCorney, Stephen Leenan, Patty Martino, Mike and Donna Cartz, Deanne Bishop, Bill Brielf, Gunter Schmidt, Marjorie Lewis, Kelly Molden, Trisha Adams, Ian Kramer, Nancy Sheldon, Lindsay Bashford, Gunmarie Hagen, Tracy Gullis, Laura Heaton, Meg for Mama Says, Rochelle Kennedy, Diana Goldman, Stacey Stokes, Ben Savage, Michael Kay, Holly Butler, Diana, David Hughes, Connie Rogers, Claire England, Sally Robertson, Parham Ganchi, Amy Daly, Brian Tourville, Mark Jeffrey Johnson, Josie Dempsey, Karen Schmidt. Pamela Hayden, Emily Perryman, Olga Sidoroska, Allison Corbett, Richard Stone, Lauren Vaught, Edible Musings, Aaron Hasty, Sean Owen, Sagar Nayak, Erica Piedra, and Danielle Roberts for your generous support of the podcast. That's it for today. As always, be well, my friends.